High Court in Alangapu City ordered the release of U.S. Marine Lance Corporal Joseph Scott Pemberton. Pemberton was escorted by immigration officers and military personnel when he left Camp Aguinaldo at around 8 in the morning. U.S. Marine Joseph Scott Pemberton was happy when his lawyer, Rowena Flores, told him the news that President Rodrigo Duterte has given him an absolute pardon. I, I still feel devastated. I really feel for, for Nanay. I feel for her because I myself as a mother, I cannot really imagine seeing the, the murderer of my daughter just simply being released, not, be, you know, not even uh, being able to serve this sentence. I wanted to scream. I wanted to... I wanted to pull my hair, I wanted to I wanted to hit something, I wanted to kick the wall. I didn't really kind of like emotionally process the release um, at the time. And I think it's been kind of like a slow burn. A lot of people worked very hard in order for a certain measure, measure of justice to be served. And I think a lot of people felt that 12, even 12 years was was already really lenient. First time, it, Jennifer was killed by Pemberton, but the second time, Jennifer was killed by this administration, by Duterte herself, whom Nanay, uh, from the very beginning, trusted. Minutes following his plane's departure, Pemberton, through his lawyer, attorney Rowena Flores, issues a message thanking President Duterte for granting him an absolute pardon. After my first um, reaction of, of anger and um, sadness, um, then I started to think about how this also makes sense if you think about the story of the U.S. and the Philippines with the Philippines as a former colony. So on paper, the Philippines looks like a democracy, even uh, President Duterte lauds the Philippines as being one of the longest-running democracies in all of Asia. But a lot of the bills that uh, were passed in the first presidential administration kind of set the course for the next 50-plus years into where we find ourselves today, uh, ensuring that Americans get um, access to being able to purchase land for uh, multinational corporations. Uh, also, military bases were set up, a mutual defense treaty. So the, the Philippines is a neo-colony. Pemberton was never going to suffer. He was never going to be in a Filipino jail. The body of an American soldier is revered, is sacred. The larger political issues are more about this, about systems of power, about you know, like the ways that we perceive the value of different types of people's lives, the way that we perceive certain lives as more worthy. December 2015, Pemberton was convicted. And immediately after that, he was detained in a special holding facility, not inside the National Bilibid Prison. He appealed this case several times. By 2018, his case was pending before the Court of Appeals. He was denied. He filed again a motion for reconsideration before the Court of Appeals. He was again denied. And then, 2019, he filed again, appealed before the Supreme Court. In 2020, during lockdown period, in June, I didn't know that he withdrew his petition for review before the Supreme Court. It means that he already admitted the fact that he killed Jennifer Laude. But again, without me knowing it, he filed a motion for release before the regional trial court invoking good conduct. Can you tell me what he's done to merit perfect good conduct scores when any other inmate you know, would have to be doing rehabilitation programs, be serving somewhat. What did Pemberton do to, to receive perfect scores across the board? It's like 
everything is being done secretly. Flores stressed she did not apply for a presidential pardon and was equally surprised by the news. I mean, he just declared absolute pardon, gave uh, absolute pardon to Pemberton, even without notifying the family first. A lot of Filipinos are have been waiting their turn to be able to be granted good conduct time allowance um, while we in Philippine jails. All of a sudden, this American cuts in the line and gets ahead of everyone and is now being ordered released. It's like, oh, I want you to treat me like a Filipino prisoner so that I can get released for good behavior, but I can't be a Filipino prisoner, you know, being in a Filipino prison. <laughs> I have to be in American custody. Flores says Pemberton has shown remorse. Of course, he's very sorry that all these things happened. But uh, as I said, you know, he's a man of very few words. Why was he pardoned when his legal team has said in public that they did not apply for it, they did not ask for it? So why was it given when it was not asked for? It's U.S. imperialism, U.S. militarization who has created this well-oiled machine for over a century in the Philippines. However, um, Local politicians have created the conditions to ensure that the system is maintained. Duterte's decision to pardon the Marine may have stemmed from his desire to get access to coronavirus vaccines. Presidential spokesperson Harry Roque, who used to lawyer for the family of slain transgender woman Jennifer Laude, urged the public to trust in the president's wisdom. <laughs> I'm fascinated by his change, by how he, he shifts from a human rights lawyer, a defender of the poor, uh, you know, and then he becomes uh, a spokesman of probably the most violent uh, Philippine president in, in history. I think that a lawyer like Roque um, was seduced by the money and the fame uh, because he is in the spotlight, you know. And that was enough, you know. That was enough for him. Joseph Scott Pemberton um, is definitely a bargaining chip. Duterte is someone who has flip-flopped between ending the Visiting Forces Agreement, um, continuing the Visiting Forces Agreement. There is this $2 billion grant to, to the Philippines given uh, by the U.S. But all this for the purpose uh, to be used to buy some arms also from U.S. The loudest lawyer, Virginia Suarez, admits nothing can be done about the case after the president exercised his prerogative to pardon. Not another nickel, not another dime, no more money for U.S. crimes. I, I am enraged with what Duterte has uh, done, but I am not intimidated at all. I think hope is infectious. You know, we need to step up and have the bodies on the streets for protests. I, I hope that that will happen. The change has to be in the culture and in people's attitudes. That's why advocacy is important. It's important to have advocates on the ground who are reaching out to their communities. Their loud chants filled the historic Hart Senate Office Building Atrium, where some of the biggest and consequential protests in Washington, D.C. have been held before. Here in the U.S., we are agents for change. You grieve, you acknowledge the pain, the, the sadness that comes with the work, and then you, you continue fighting because you know that it's bigger than one person, it's bigger than Jennifer, it's bigger than myself as an individual, but we're really fighting for our collective liberation and you know we can't stop and then we find healing in, in fighting.
I don't necessarily focus on him a lot as a person, you know, because because for me, there are so many Pembertons. Hopefully, as, you know, as people become more educated and more aware of trans people in the world that, you know, that men especially um, are raised to understand that there is a great diversity in the way that people conceive of and present and express their gender so that a crime like the murder of Jennifer Laude wouldn't happen again. And I think that's definitely a world worth fighting for in the U.S. You know, just like the very notion that trans people exist as real people is being questioned. It has been part of my impetus to focus on thinking of new worlds rather than writing about what other people have been doing to and against trans people and trans communities. Presidential frontrunner Ferdinand Marcos Jr. gets the ball rolling on his new administration. I have noted his statements about his father's administration downplaying the human rights violations, downplaying the graft and the corruption. And that felt really difficult and offensive for me to hear and read about. As somebody who was a child during that administration, I do have memories about the political killings, about, you know, the poverty. Autocrats manipulate history. Uh, and often the manipulation of history is about how the conclusion of the history is the regime. The regime makes sense. It, it should continue. Empire as an idea is about American military conquest. This is what Pemberton is, right? He's a representation of uh, the U.S. military industrial complex. The United States also reminds ironclad in our, remains ironclad in our commitment to the defense of the Philippines. All of these questions start to swirl again. What about people who don't necessarily have the power to stand up to this American force if, heaven forbid, something like um, the Jennifer Laude situation happens again. 